place up, fuck the place All right, let's get started. A um, couple, couple quick things. Um, first off, uh, the final, all the final wink groups are up. So if you need to do a makeup group, you can do, still do block six and then do a makeup group or whatever. Do it. Don't miss a group. If you, if you, if you sign up for groups from here on out, don't miss them because uh, especially if it's an, an international group, okay, uh, or a global group. All right, that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, Thursday, uh, we are, it's going to be, a, nah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you what we're doing. All right, let's just, let's just go with today. So, uh, what, what, so the, the, the title of today's class is, why aren't we melting? And, this, this is, uh, I, I just want to, I think I want to have a conversation about this, and we're going to bring it home onto the, really onto Penn State campus and look at fraternity and sorority life here, because I think that's a, just a, a nice place to, to start. And uh, what, there, there, there are a couple things, right? Human beings, human be oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. I started a class with human beings. <laughs> oh my God, I should be fired. All right, so uh, I think one of the, uh, <laughs> man, I, look, first off, hey, can I speak to the stream for a second? Um, what, what you don't know, if you're watching, especially if you're watching from a really warm place right now, which many of you are, um, it's sunny. Well, maybe it's sunny, but warm and nice. It's not warm and nice here. We had snow yesterday. We had snow today. It's really cold, and it's brutal. Like spring came, and then spring left. So uh, I'm not sure when it's coming back. Looks like maybe this weekend a little bit, but yeah, so it's tough, man. So like, it, it's hard to really get jazzed up because it takes a little extra energy. All right. So um, one of the things that we're, the, we're struggling with all the time is the degree, is, is how people come together, how they integrate, or how, they, how they're able to a, either A, it, take two different customs, sets of customs and cultures and, and languages and just ways of being in the world and br blend them together, bring them together, and, and either A, maintain those separate ways of being, those separate customs, uh, but do it kind of side by side, and then really appreciate each other's uh, just ways, ways of being. You got two people, you got two groups, and you, you, you bring them together. They got to like, you know, how each group doesn't really want to give a lot up, right? So for example, many of you may wonder, how, why is it or how is it? Hey, by the way, you're not, you can't have your laptop open, by the way. So or phones out. So many of you probably wonder, how is it that immigrants come to, the, to this country or to come to go to a country and like don't learn the language and don't learn the customs or don't really integrate or they hang out with other immigrants or w people from their own country? It's like, well, all you have to do is imagine yourself moving to another place where you don't really know anyone and you're most likely going to seek out the familiar. You're going to speak your own language and the older you are, the, the more difficult it is to learn another language just because it's like, it takes concentration and time and it's, it's just really hard. You know, as you get older, especially, you know, you get, you get into like my age and like, God, my, my brain's already busy thinking about a million things. Like, I don't have time to be Try, trying to memorize verbs and nouns and pronouns and figure it all out and like, ah, oh God. So it's just so much easier for me to speak English or speak with people in another country that speak English, right? I always try to learn a few words when I, when I travel, but like, you know, besides Spanish, I really don't know very much. I mean, I always learn like bathroom and beer. Beer is always an important one. And, uh, but, you know, whatever, right? So, 
So it's a, so, so, hum, so we're always struggling. To, you, got, you got groups of people, they, they come together. To what degree do they hang on to their old ways of being? And to what degree do they adapt to the other group? Especially if they're in, if, if they're migrating into another culture. And to what degree do these two groups come together and, and form like sort of a blending of a culture, of a culture and a way of being? Like, how do they, when do they do that or how do they do that? And that's, the, we've been struggling with that since the, the dawn of humanity. I mean, since the very beginning, right? This is a struggle and it's a struggle all over the world, okay? So when you, when you see, um, just here, when you, when you encounter, I don't know, the, uh, it's just, it's, it's just, you got to find the bat. Yo, man. Oh, shit. Listen, do me a, do me a favor, all right? Everyone just cl- close, everyone close your eyes for a second, okay? Just, everyone, just close your eyes for a second, okay? Listen, here's what's up. Um, here's what I want you to do. Um, e- even at the top, just close your eyes, right? Um, imagine just for a hot minute that you're me, okay? And you're standing up here, and you, you may or may not have something interesting to say, but, you know, maybe you have a few interesting things to say. And we're going to have a class, and we're going to bring some of your classmates up. And, wait, hang on, you, haven't, you don't have your eyes closed. Your eyes aren't closed. All right. So, uh, just imagine how difficult it would be. Just keep your eyes closed. Imagine how difficult it would be if, you, if everyone you saw just had a kind of a scowl on their face, even if you understood it, because they didn't really want to be here, because they don't really want to be anywhere except somewhere that it's warm, and just how hard that would be. You, you know what I mean? So here's what I want. Just, we're going to, we get, we have an hour and three minutes. Just go for it, man. Put your best face on, and let's do it. We're in this together. Okay, cool? Got it? Because this is actually going to be a re- an interesting class. All right, thanks, man. All right. So, here we go. We have this idea that the United States is this place that's like this melting pot, and it would be a melting pot, but like, what, what, what is that? Like, that, that, that happens to a degree but only to a degree do people really embrace new cultures, right? Some, I mean, some people do all the way, and other people don't at all, and most of us are somewhere in between. And this is what we're working with all the time. And so, and so it's really awesome. When, when I meet immigrants, like, like I have a neighbor who's from India. He is far more American than I am by far and away this guy in every aspect of his being is he American way more than I am he's from India he didn't come here until he was in his I think he was like 30 early 30s and and I'm like damn dude it's awesome when I meet people like that and it's equally as awesome when I meet people who just don't ever even learn more than a couple words of English they just they eat their own food they're just, that, it's just what it is. They just don't, they're just living here, but they're, they're really living back home, but they happen to be living here in this country. Both are awesome. It's just part of what it is, right? Okay, so uh, I want to just say a couple things. I want to just show you a couple pieces of this. This is the, this is the U.S. map in, in 1848, right, right at the end of the Mexican-American War. And, and I, I just want to point a couple things out about the United States. This was all Mexico here. All of this. The Uni- in this war, the United States took, we say won, the Mexicans say stolen, we stole 55% of Mexico, and we just took that over. The, the people who are all speaking Spanish, who lived all along here, they didn't, they didn't cross the border, the border crossed them. Nothing changed for them. So th- this, is part, this is the United States. This is what we're built on. 
is this is you know taking land that you know and why and what was Mexico? You know, Mexico was this land that the Spanish had taken, and so Spain, Spanish became the the a, a dominant language in Mexico, and then and then we went you know a couple hundred years later we took it from them, but the idea being that. So this is like, when we think about Russia right now in Ukraine, and we think about how, you know, Russia is trying to take Ukraine, really. They're going to keep the name, but essentially they want it as part of Russia. And we think, like, this is terrible. You're going in there, you're bombing the hell, you're bombing all these people, you're killing so many people, you're destroying so many things, and you're going to take a land, and they're going to, in the end, probably force your language onto them. And it's like, well, that's what we did right here. It's the same thing. But we don't see it that way in the United States because we are here. We see it as a war. It just kind of is a war. I if I had to ask, how, how many of you could say more than, say something for more than 60 seconds on the Mexican-American war? How many people? 60 seconds you could say something other than what I just said. Anybody? Like nobody? Not a single person? One person. That's it? So like, okay, this is big. This is, look, you, you see how, how major that is for all of these people here and what it would be if, if, they, if it was still Mexico. And then you think like, okay, well, why should they become part of the, why should they learn English or why should they not hang on to Mexico, to their customs or to their, you know what I mean? Why, why, why wouldn't they hang on to that? They didn't ask to be for that border to get moved. So like, what, what would that be? And then on top of that, do you think how well all these people of European ancestry that were coming east and took over all those lands, how do you think they treated Mexicans? How, how, how do you think they really treated Mexicans? And how many of you know anything about how Mexicans were treated and what they went through? I mean, you know, we talk about in, in the U.S., like, uh, you know, the, the black, we talk about slavery, the black codes, the, the killing or genocide of Native Americans. We don't talk about Mexicans. I will tell you, just do a little bit of research. Like, it was brutal. People were just absolutely brutalized. And so, like, why would they be part of the United States? Who would want to be part of the U.S. going back, you know, 160 years? And then we think about slaves. So these are all the slave states. So this is 1848, right? And, like, we didn't, like... You know, the, the Mexicans here gave their best energy to say, okay, we're going to live here. This is now, well, I'm now American. I was a Mexican, now I'm an American. I'm going to live here. But then people came and then they pl planted their crops and they, they had a homestead and there they were. And then these other people just came along and like, you're Mexican, get the hell out. And they were killed, they were brutalized, their land was taken and all sorts of stuff. Well, same with slaves. So you got all these black people living here, and at the end of the Civil War, they're all saying like, all right, the war, war's, slavery's over. We're going to just be part of the, the U.S. But the white people here said, no, you're not going to do that. We're going to make sure that you continue to be in your place. And we're basically going to reinstitute the, 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 the institution of slavery. We're going we're to bring it back without calling it slavery. And like, okay. So what, what would you do if you were Mexican or what would you do if you were black and you're trying to integrate and you're not able to integrate? Like you're really trying to do that. You would say, you would start your own institutions. You would do your own thing. You'd have your own schools. You'd have, you'd have everything. Every, you'd just do everything on your own. It's like, well, you're not going to let me be part of your society, so we're going to do all this stuff on our own. And like, okay. You know, so the, then the people said, why don't you integrate? Well, why didn't you let us integrate? Why didn't you embrace us as part of your culture? And this is what we're dealing with all the time. This is what Russians are going to do with Ukrainians, right? It'll be the same thing there. It's the same thing all over. It's just part of how we operate. But we never look, we look at the problem is the people that don't immigrate. The problem is never the people that don't allow them to immigrate. So, um, if we go to, so therefore, I think I, I showed you these numbers before. You, today, you have 330 million Americans. You've got 42 million people that speak Spanish. Well, if you go back one slide and you look at all this land, this Spanish speaking, all the way really up into here. And like, 
all this land that's Spanish speaking, so now go forward. Why wouldn't we have at least 42 million people in the United States that speak Spanish? Such a huge part of the U.S. was a Spanish speaking area. So, you know, you, why, why wouldn't we have that? And, and, and why, why wouldn't that just be okay? It's like, it's cool, all right, awesome. And then these Spanish-speaking people start moving from that area out to the rest of the country. And so like, all right, well, that's what it is. You know, and if you look at it like that, then you think, okay, it kind of makes sense. Because I will tell you that if you emigrate to Iceland, I don't know, Sweden, or, or Italy, or where, I don't know, Korea, or Taiwan, if you go there, and you, and you go with a, you have a partner, and then you have kids, and you all speak English, you're going to demand that your kids speak, like, if you're, I don't know, if you're in Hong Kong, you're going to want them to speak English, and they're maybe going to want to speak Canton, eh, Hong Kong's a bad idea, Japanese, right? You're going to want them to speak English, and they're going to want to speak Japanese, and you're going to be trying to teach them English, you're going to demand that they speak it, and they're going to maybe only want to speak Japanese, because their friends speak Japanese, so why would they want to speak English? They feel weird speaking English, you speak English, you sound weird, like the whole thing. And so th that's what we're dealing with all the time, right? Okay, so next slide. Uh, then I think about Native Americans. Today we have 2.6 million tribal citizens, and we have, you know, 326 Indian, Native re Indian reservations. And, you know, over, you know, 573, 574 different federally recognized tribes in the United States of tribes that are like tr they're trying to th dude go can you go back to the map all this land was theirs man all of it all of it was theirs their groups their cultures and so they're trying to hang on to their cultures and then we like push people into these these you know go forward a couple more now to these reservations this the worst land the smallest area like you get forced into these reservations and they're trying to hang on they're trying to teach languages to the young people they're trying you know you know what i mean so like, why wouldn't they right and so then you got people saying like oh you're native why are you separating yourself like we're separating ourselves because our people have been like have you, do you know the history of our people you know what happened like we're just trying to hang on and besides, you, you know, you don't accept us. You know, the, you know that you don't hear it here, right? But, but you know, like, the, the most common reference to Native Americans. See, the, slur, the ethnic slurs for, for Native um, uh, American Indians, common slurs all the time. The, peop, the most common slurs that are used are, the, we, are people who drop the N-bomb on Native Americans, right? So, like... The red, the red end bomb, the tree end bomb, the this, that, the other thing. It's like the end bomb, the N word is the use for, it's just after another, after another, right? And it's just like, God, this stuff that goes on. And why do you think they would want to be part of, of white, of this society? Not just white society, black society and Hispanic society. Because black people are, treat American Indians like shit, just like white people do. So, like, what is, why would they want to? You, you know what I mean? You understand? So you, now you're dealing with this. It's like you got this group over here and you're saying, hey, you should be part of the mainstream. And you got this other group over here saying, like, yeah, I know I'd like to be part of the mainstream, but if I'm going to be part of the mainstream, like, you have, to, you have to, like, acknowledge certain things. You have to treat me in a certain way. Like, you have to respect me a little bit. You know what I mean? Just a little bit. It doesn't even have to be a lot. And then over here, if, if people aren't willing to do that, well, why are they going to come together? And this is what we're battling with all the time. And this is the problem of making a society that, in which people get along. This is what we're dealing with all the time, man. How do you build a land in which people get along? Cool? Right? All right, so here. Go to the next one. I think I have something else. So, so then you look at H, HBCUs, right? And you think like, okay, so we have all these black universities and colleges, right? You know, where it's like, okay, anybody can go there, but, you know, these are really built, or black people built these institutions. And white people say, hey, why, so why'd you do that? 
Why do you all separate yourselves? Why do you have a university that's just for black people? Like, what's that about? Why do you do that? Why do you have schools just for black people? Like, why, what's the point of that? Look, when HBCUs emerged in, in the, in, first off, begin to emerge as black people started to going to college, black people aren't allowed into white universities and colleges. You're not going to go there. You can't go there. So what would you do if you're not allowed? You're going to do it on your own, right? Why wouldn't you do it on your own? So then we, this is one example of people that are saying like, okay, well, you won't let us go to college in your university, so we'll build our own university to the degree to which in the 30s there were 121 HBCUs in the United States. Most of them in the South, where Jim, Jim Crow is rampant, where segregation is legal, where black people and white people aren't even allowed to interact, and, and they're not allowed to marry, and, and in most cases, not even allowed to interact in these, in these sort of official, in so many official ways. So, like, black people go out and say, all right, well, to hell with you. We'll go do it on our own. Well, they should be, a, then the black community should be applauded. You, you know what I mean? Like, this is, the, this is how this stuff works. Native Americans start their own colleges and university. We have colleges for Native peoples. Why? Because they couldn't go to white colleges. So, like, okay, well, you're going to do it on our own. So, like, all right. And now we have today where we still have HBCUs and people say, well, yeah, but, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. You're allowed to go to universities that are really for white people. But like, okay, but now these institutions are, they have roots and they're deep. Just like Penn State has roots and they're deep. Just like many of you have parents and grandparents that went to Penn State and that's why you're here. Well, see, you have all sorts of black people that have deep ties to these HBCUs and so they continue. And then that's awesome. That can just go away. But yet we sit back and then we complain and we struggle. And so, you know, I don't know. Go, go, go to the, so we're, I want to, so we're going to talk about fraternities and sororities for a hot minute, in a, in a minute, but here, the, let me just walk you through a couple of things for those who aren't in the frat sorority world. So the pan Council, this is for, this is soror, white, it's, it's white sororities. Now, anybody can join the sorority now, but historically, in 1902, when it starts, all the way up into the 60s, it's basically very, very few anybody who's not white women who are not white, it is almost predominantly for white people, okay? And then you have the interfraternity council, same thing. This is when it's, the council is formed. It's not when the first sorority and fraternity were formed. So same thing for white men. And then, so black men are going, black men and black women are going to universities, right? Because they're going to HBCUs. And a few people are going to white colleges and universities, but mostly HBCUs, because that's the nature of it, right? And they say, okay, well, can we, can our fraternity join up with the white fraternities? Or can our black women's sororities join up with white women's sororities? And the white women's sororities and white male fraternities say, like, nah, man, no, 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 you can't, you're not, you're not, yeah, we don't do that. You're not gonna, you can't be part of our umbrella organization. So they start their own, the National Penalty Council, right? This is like, this started with the, what's called the Divine Nine, the initial, the first fraternities and sororities. And so like, okay, well today we still have the MPHC here at Penn State. These, these councils are all at Penn State. So we still have it here at Penn State. Do you, you wanna know why we have, why we have these, these black sororities and black fraternities, why they're separated from the white Greeks because back in the day we didn't allow black women and black men the black first off black men and black women couldn't join the white sororities and fraternities okay so you can't join first off and then when they say okay that's cool no problem we'll just start our own okay so can we can ours be part of your umbrella organization nah you can't do that either so then it becomes like oh well f you then I guess we'll have to go do it on our own and so when, you, when I see, when I think about the, the MPHC today at Penn State, I think like that's, that is rooted in, in racist white supremacy in this country. It, otherwise it wouldn't exist. And it still exists because that's the nature. Of course it still exists because there are roots. Because if you have like, 
if, if your parents or went to like a, were, were part of a black sorority or your grandparents or your aunts or your uncles or great aunts or great uncles, then you're probably going to want to be part of that too because it lives on. The same reason that many of you came to Penn State. Because you're like, yeah, I'm going to go to Penn State because it's part of a family tradition. Well, I'm going to join the Alphas, for example, because it's part of a family tradition. Or the Qs or something, right? It's part of a family tradition, and so that's what we do. Like, okay. So we have all this separation now that only exists because of the, the, in this country, in this essence, because of the white supremacist segregation. Dude. Is that the first time I've said white supremacy twice? Twice in one lecture I said that. So this is where Fox News will come after me for, for, uh, for brainwashing you into critical race theory. So this is critical race theory, right? And like, tell me why you wouldn't want to know this. Like, why wouldn't we want to know this? And what's wrong with knowing this? Because that's what it is. So like I look, we look around at black people and say, why are you always talking about race or why do you separate yourselves or this, that, the other thing? Well, because what happened in the past matters now. You, you know what I mean? So it's like, okay. I'd love to just disband the NPHC because like we don't need it anymore, but, but it has roots and it's a cool thing. Just like think by other pieces here at Penn State. It's like it has roots and so we, all right, it's all good. We keep doing it. All right, great. Why would I like to disband it? Because I, I, I think it could, cause it could be just one organiza- umbrella organization that like really held all of these groups together. That would be awesome. We'll call it some new name. But, you know, it's history and so we do it. And then we have the Multicultural Greek Council. That was only started in 1998 because more and more brown people were going to universities and starting Greek organizations. And so then we needed more organizations. But like the... the um, the, the, this, this is hang on I gotta see if I feel like talking about this so so the, this is the, the association of the council for Asian students Asian frater- sororities fraternities and sororities of which there are about 60 different chapters in the US or different organizations and this is for Latinos and they weren't started until here. Like the, the first Asian sorority was in, in 1916. And the first Hispanic uh, fraternity or sorority was in 1889. But the organization didn't start until this time. And this is Asian Pacific Islander DESI Association. And DESI is just is the name that we use. It's, a scan, it's actually a Sanskrit word. Does anyone know what it is? It's a Sanskrit word. Do you know what it is? Yeah. It's a, do you know what it is, bro? It's Desi, D-E-S-I. It's a, it's Sanskrit where it means land, right? And 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 that's for South Indians, like pa- people from Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, India, right? Okay, so there it is. Dudes, you see, we're 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 always gonna be working with this daisy daisy all right daisy (laughs) all right do you know like Life's just really complicated. And it's okay. If you think, if you think it's not complicated, like everyone has their, like, <clears throat> their uncle or father or somebody in their family, mother, I don't know who the hell, grandmother, grandfather, <clears throat> who's always saying, like, it's really simple. It's just like this. Dot, 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 dot. Like that, when someone starts out, it's really simple. Um, it's generally, watch out, because the next thing out of their mouth is probably going to be not very smart, because nothing is simple. Man. All right, so we have five volunteers today. 
and I want you to answer, you're going to answer this question, right? Uh, go to the next slide. Here's a picture of, I don't know when this, I think I, I've walked past Old Main a couple of times when photos like this are taken. This is the PHC. This is soror what the PC sororities at Penn State, okay? Um, it's white, man. A lot of white people in there. I was in this room one time when they were, right after my class once, they were, yeah, white sororities were doing recruitment in this room. And I remember I, with, the room was filled, right? They were, it, was the it was the beginning of rush kind of thing. And I remember walking, it, you know, I, I was in the back room and I had to leave and I was walking up the stairs. And I was like, I've never seen so many white people in a room in all my life, right? And I kept just looking for the black people or a brown person. And I, I think I remember seeing one, but whatever. There's a lot of white people there. Okay, so go to the next one. That's Penn State. This is not Penn State. I think this might be at Howard or something. I don't know where I got this photo, but I couldn't find a really good one. So here's, like, these are some groups from the, from, at a university from the Divine Nine, right? So look, where are the white people? Because, like, you can go to an HBCU, any white piece. By the way, if you're white and, like, you want a scholarship, go, go check out some of the HBCUs because you can, you can be eligible for some scholarship money. You, you, you know what I mean? Which is kind of cool. Or, or if you're Asian or Hispanic, Hispanic. But also you can join. It, just because it's historically black doesn't mean you can't join. Like whatever. Go for it. Join. Anyway, next one. This is, uh, an, uh, this, is I, this might be at Cornell. I, don't, I, don't, I forget where this is. Or Virginia. I don't remember. Or Indiana maybe. Um, so here's the, the Hispanic chapters. It's like. Where are the white people, man? Where are the black people? I guess there's a black Hispanic dude in the back, maybe. Yeah, see there in the back on the left? And then here's the next one. This is a, a, a Korean chapter. Or not, pardon me, not Korean, Asian chapter. This, is, this, I think, is at Cornell, right? So, okay, so you got that? You all see that? All right, you can blacken that. Okay, can, I, can volunteers come up? You can, you can sit here, bro. Man, mana, mana. Did I get it right? The rest of you, do you the three of you sit here, over here. Do you have another? Uh... Thanks, man. All right, man. So, dude, so you're in a, say, just say your name and like how you're connected to the Greek life or whatever. Um, I'm Robert. Um, I'm in SIGEP here. SIGEP? Yeah. Are you guys, act, so you're, you're, active right now you're not on probation or anything? uh yeah we're active yeah all right i was actually looking at the list of all the press and sororities that are on probation and all and like i was also looking at by the way can i just say something about because you can go online and look at like the gpas of like who's above and below the the university average and i'm like i don't want to drop the f-bomb but it was like the fuck okay all right, dude. Okay, so good, man. Are you part of the, or are you do, are you a, do, do you do something? Uh, yeah, I'm the, I'm the risk manager there. Risk so. manager? Yeah. All right. Okay. Yes. Um, my name's Callie, and I'm in KD. What are you in? KD, Kappa Delta. Yep, Kappa Delta. Okay. And, yes, Randy. Hi, everyone. My name is Randy Abodi, and I am in Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Dude, y'all say you always say the incorporated thing, man. Yeah. I love that. Well, how come you how come you guys don't say that? Because you're incorporated too. See, that's a hit. That's a history thing, right? This is what I'm talking about. Like, this is part of it, and this is part of, you know. Look, when you're hang on, I'm gonna get to you in a second. So they in their their fraternity and sorority. It's just like this. This they, there's just emerge when it's just part of life. And it's all good. And you just, you form it and you come together. You assign some letters to yourself that are incomprehensible and like whatever it means. But Randy's sorority, they come up at a time when they're like, she's not a, dude, Randy's and the, the original people in your sorority. Wait, what is it again? Callie. They, they wanted to be part of Callie's sorority. Callie's sorority said like, nah, you can't do that. And so they go do their own. And then it becomes like this 
thing that's like big. So wait, so how do you, so what's in the name of it again? Say it again. Say it really loud and proud. Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Incorporated, man. It's like, yo, MFers, it's incorporated. <laughs> Got it? So like, that's basically your sorority saying that to the, to the other side. It's just like, okay. All right, man. M Man Manav. Yeah. Where you, we, yeah. uh, hi, my name is Manov. I'm an international student from India, and I'm not part of any fraternity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be, dude? Uh, maybe next semester. I've not thought about it. Because Robert's fraternity is like the most diverse of all the white fraternities. How many black and brown people do you have? Um, I'd probably say 10, or like around that number. <laughs> yeah. Wait, how big are you, though? There's like 120 of us. 120, 10. But wait, are the 10 no, like, are the, wait, that's not funny, actually. But, <laughs> how, but are the 10, like, full? Um, I mean, like, I can't speak for them, but, like, I'd say out of the 10, maybe, like, six, or there's some, like, mixed people. All right, okay, I got you. All right. You know, have you ever thought about joining? Do you, do you even uh, know what it is? Uh, I, I have some idea about it, but I was going to rush when uh, fraternity last semester. But I gave up the idea at that time, and I might do it next time. So. Yeah? Yeah. All right, dude. Well, if you're cool up here, and there's some frat bros out there, they might, like, come up and hit you up to, like, pledge for them. You know what I mean? All right. Chan. Um, hi, I'm Chan, and I'm from South Korea. And have you, did you think about joining a sorority? Yeah? Do you have sororities in Korea at the universities? What is a sorority? Can, you, can someone tell her what a sorority is? Um, a sorority is just like an organization where you do service work and it's about a sisterhood. Yeah, y'all say that, but I was looking. <laughs> I, it's basically a place you go to drink. And however, not sororities because they're all on campus, right? But I was looking at all the volunteer hours per person and I'm like, I was not impressed, man. There was one that ra you, you all raised a lot of money for Thun. Y'all like MPAC, you're not, the Thun, Thun thing ain't happening for MPAC. But for you all, like for sororities, there's a couple that are like serious, man. Anyway, that's what it is. You go hang out with people who, yeah, you go get ideas for, yeah, whatever. Okay, so listen, here's the deal. Here's what I want the two of you to do. You got to find out from them. Remember the, the, the um, photos that I showed? Like, you see, it's white people, black people, Asian people, Hispanic people. And there's a degree. This guy, so for example, um, wait, in your sorority, how many black and brown women are there? Um, there's like one girl who's African, and I think she's mixed. And I'd say there's like a few Hispanic, a few Albanian, but that's about it. And you? Yeah, there is one other Asian. Uh huh. Hey, do you know where she's from, by the way, Ch Chun? Do you have any idea? Where would you guess? I'm not, sh I'm not sure. Yeah? M Manav, what do you think? Hey, wait, can you do, can you, Green, can you do a close up? Do you mind, Callie? Do a close up? Because yeah, she actually has a really cool story. I might be wrong, but she, uh, she is mixed and has one Asian parent. Yeah, exactly. No, she doesn't. She's 100% she's Chinese. Kelly is 100% Chinese, right? Yeah. Which, is, which is so awesome. You, I mean, it's re here's the deal, right? China, it's like, look, China's a huge landmass. Africa is a huge landmass. If you walk from, from El, you know, Algeria or Tunisia or Libya and you walk all the way down to South Africa, by the time you get to South Africa, where you start out and where you end, you would have no idea that you're in the same continent. So we talk about Africans. We just assume we, everybody thinks Africans and we think Randy. But like Randy's only a small part. People who look like Randy are only a small part of Africa. Not small, but uh, not inconsequential, but only a part of Africa. So China's the same way. So Cali, is, but you're, so you're adopted, right? 
So Callie is 100, so did, I looked at her DNA test, which is so awesome, like, so you're adopted, and so there are these different um, ancestry groups around China that have very different features, and so, like, it's just cool, it'll be really cool, so what I want to say to you, I'm going to just say this now, give it another, like, 15 years, and when, when we get more markers for, for China, which we're doing, we're getting more markers, and you'll be able to really pin down exactly what part of China your parents are from, because it's really awesome. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. Ready? I want you to figure out from them why it is that they're all not, why is, why they're not mixed up? You got to figure out what's going on, like what, 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 do you, what do you, so it's, okay, go ahead. Mark. Um, with all the applications that you get for uh, fraternities and sororities, what percentage is from um, black, brown, and mixed people? Dude, nice question. Um, we don't really get like applications, but we'll have like zone days where like people will come out and like look at the house. Um, and just from being there, like I'd probably say maybe fifteen to twenty percent, like not a not a high percentage at all, are are not white. So, Chan, remember, your job is to find out why these things are so, those photos that I showed, why everyone, there are all these different groups. Why aren't they all mixed up? And mind you, some of them are, right? And we got it. Like, if I showed you Roberts, you would see the, the six or ten black or brown people, right? But, so, do you have another? Go ahead. Uh, um, which qualifications or which criteria you look for, you know, possible candidate for your frat or sorority. Go ahead. Yeah, Randy, how about you take that? Um, so nationally, you have to have a 2.75 GPA, but honestly, well, for my organization, honestly, you are meeting the bare requirements and they're not gonna look at you um, because I think our chapter GPA right now within Penn State, I believe we have a 3.6, so we're not gonna look at anybody that's like 2.75 because we're trying to keep our GPA up and then you have to have, um, I know for like applications, you have to have a certain amount of community service hours. Uh, um, it's over, I know it's over 25 hours like that you have to do within yourself and it has to be within a certain amount of time. Um, you have to have like you have to know people in the organization that can vouch for you. You also have to, um, you can't have a criminal record because they will do a background check on you. Um, you have to have like, you don't have to have leadership positions, but like honestly people are looking for those that can lead and like be a change in the community, things like that. And then it's just some things I can't say because I don't want to get snatched by nationals. <laughs> I can say them though. All right, but go ahead. Do you have another question? Do you, wait, do you want, yeah, what was your question uh, again? Um, it was, uh, what are the qualifications or criteria required for someone to be considered? So to be a part of the IFC, you have to have a 3.0 GPA, or you have to have, a, yeah, I think it's a 3.0 GPA, or that's what our house is, you have to have a 3.0. Um, and then you have to have like a certain amount of credits to fit within your credit window. Um, you can't be a first semester freshman um, if you're like Penn State doesn't allow you to rush your freshman year uh, first semester um, and like you just have to have a certain amount of credits scheduled and a certain GPA that's to register through the IFC there's other fraternities that aren't affiliated with the IFC who can take basically whoever they want yeah. I guess it's according to like their fraternities nationals uh -huh. whether or not they want those certain people in but yes yeah, spe SIGEP specifically it's like a 3-0 um, and that's really like, as far as academics, that's what we're looking at. Do you have, Callie, we're gonna, you're gonna answer the next one. Do you have, you had a question? Um, do you guys have any like common interests online? Oh, great question. Yeah, do you have any common interests, Callie? Um, I feel like a lot of common interests for sororities a lot of it is value-based, so we just talk about like what you do in your free time or what you like to do outside of school, really, what matters. So I guess if you're involved in other organizations, they look for that or... 
Okay, so yeah. I have a question. Just outside involvement, really. Do you have a follow-up? Because I have a follow-up if you don't. No, here's... So, what, so what's, the di what's the difference between your common interests and Randy's common interests her, and her sorority? Your sorority and her sorority. What's the difference in the common interests? I mean, I'm sure there probably isn't a lot. Like, a lot of girls like to watch Euphoria or basic shows like that. But I feel like the majority of it is connecting with the girl you speak to during recruitment. Uh-huh. Do you guys watch Euphoria? Um, yeah, there's no interest right there. Um, <laughs> like, no. Um, so basically with us, I know for my sorority, the, um, like the interest is to serve the black community and to do public service and to create a sisterhood and create like, um, to create basically a network and a safe space for like people that look like us, but also people that are allies for the black community. Um, well, and like, so, um, so, okay, but so could Callie join your sorority? Yes, um, Callie can join the sorority, but the thing is, is like, because there are white people in the sorority, there's like uh -huh. different races in the uh, sorority, but like they all share a common interest to serve the black community or they've been allies and they want to create a change um, within like, the world basically uh -huh. okay All and right. like another thing like we don't do like recruitment like you come to us you show interest in us you come to our programs we we're not going out and reaching out and saying like oh hey join like we have programs and things um and that's how like you show your interest but we're not having like a rush on the hub lawn or anything like mm -hmm. no and then like Another thing I know with Penhell and I think IFC, like they would, like they pick, like everybody goes and visits and then they pick yeah. um, who's gonna be in it. But it's like with our organizations, like you pick one and that's like, you pick one and yeah. like you can't go and say like, I can't go to another sorority and be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna look at you too. Like, no, it's like, I, it's either Delta or nothing for me. Okay, got you. So, do you have a question? Yeah. All right. And then we'll go back to Robert. Um, so is not having common in interest the main reason for the dispropor dispropor disproportionation that we see? Like, it is majority white dominated. So, yeah, Robert. So is it lack of common interest? Like, what is that the main reason? Um, yeah, I think that's a huge part of it. It's like you're, there's like a rush chair and like a rush committee, and you'll have rush events and like, people will come to the house and like you'll have conversations and I guess if people, it's basically just like if you're connecting with someone like you, you just have to have common interests with them. Um, when I rushed, it was like during COVID, so like it was on Zoom um, and there was like thousands of people on these like Zoom calls and like my grade, like there was only 21 of us that like were in the new group. So like, at, like coming down from like that big number down to only 21, like there's gotta be some sort of factor like common interest or something going on there that would account for that, I would assume. So, so what would it take, what do you think it would take, do you have another, I have a question if you don't, Shane, do you have a question? Okay, hang, hold tight, I'm gonna jump in with one. What do you think it would have taken for you? First off, Randy, do you have family, I'm gonna come back, do you have family members who are in a, in a black sorority? Yes, but they're not in the same sorority as me. But they're, but they're, but they're in sorority, they're Greek. They have letters. Yeah, I have one family member. Just one? And she went here, yeah. Old, so older than you. She's, yeah, she graduated in like 2019. Okay, all right. But, but it's not like, not like parents and aunts and uncles mm -hmm. and that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. So what, what do you think, bro, what do you think would, would have taken for you to be interested in a black or brown fraternity? I wasn't necessarily interested in, in like, when I came to Penn State, I didn't even think about Greek life. Like, I didn't even know that, like, that was a thing. I didn't know anyone. Like, a lot of people come from Pennsylvania and, like, know kids that went to high school with who are in Greek life. I didn't know anyone in Greek life when I was, like, decided to rush. Um, it was just the fact that the sororities rushed earlier than the um, fraternities. So, like, all my friends who I would end up going out with were already in their sororities. And so, like, all the guys were kind of left with, like, we got to figure something out to do. So that's why I decided to rush. So, like, I just wanted to, like, have something to do. But... Um, yeah, so I wasn't really like looking for it to as terms of like to find my own group or something. It was more just to have something to do. But 
But, yeah. Right. So you, one thing that you could do, you could have done a lot of things. Right? Right. You just happened to do something with lots and lots of white people. Yes. So what's the, and there, there's nothing, remember Grace? Where's Grace? Remember that? Remember the conversation I had with Grace a couple, several weeks ago? It's like, yeah, well, whatever, that's what most people do. You know what I mean? But, so it's not like, there's, it's, not, it's, it's not a problem. It's what most of us do most of the time. But like, how? Like, how did you get to that? Where you would just be like, yeah, I wouldn't even consider, would you even consider joining like a black frat? Um, probably not, just because like, that's, I don't know, like, I would want to go to a group that I see myself like, fitting in, and I don't know, if I'd, I feel like I'd have a tough time fitting in there. So, Mana, does that kind of answer your question, the, your earlier question about interest? Yes, it does. But it's another, it's a fitting in piece. Mm-hmm. It's not just interest, it's fitting in. Like, huh. Mana, let me ask you a question. If you, so, if you had a fraternity, and you had like an Indian fraternity here at Penn State, right? Or Daisy, Daisy, a Daisy fraternity. Uh, you know, like APAC Daisy, or you had like a white fraternity or a black fraternity, which one do you think you'd be more drawn to? Um, pro- probably the Indian fraternity because I would fit in more in that. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Chain, how about you? Could you see yourself in a white sorority? Not really. How come? Like, why? What, what do you see? When you think about being in a white sorority, what do you imagine? I'm um, being different. Are you um, being different? Yeah. Yeah, and and that would mean what? Not fitting in. Uh huh. So, Randy, how about you? Like, could you imagine? If, it's like, Callie, would your sorority like to have Randy as a? You have a high GPA, so that's cool. Like. What about Ran- what if Randy rushed? Would what would people like? I don't know. Yeah. Um, I feel like a lot of people think sororities care about looks a lot, but it's mostly about your connection with the person you talk to. So in that short period of time you are having a conversation, you really have to connect with a girl in order to be asked back. Okay, so it's about so if Randy was a black woman, if Randy's a black woman who's like, hey, she can like do like. Okay, so look, first off, let's just go to you for a second. So you, you were adopted by a white family. So you, right? So yes. your parents are white? Yeah. Do you have white siblings? No, I'm the only child. The only child? Okay, so you grew up in a white, did you grow up with a lot of black and brown people or just mostly white people? Um, I had like a few girls as neighbors, but they were white. I didn't really grow up around a lot of diverse culture. Okay. All right. So this goes back to an earlier conversation we had about people who are adopted, cross, cross-cultural or cross-racial adoption, right? It's like, of course, Callie is going to be like, just in this deep existential way, of course, you're going to just feel like a certain comfort among people who look like me, among white people, Right. So it's like, of course, that's just a given. You know what I mean? If you grew up, if you were adopted by a black family, you'd probably be in Randy's, you'd be much more likely to be in Randy's sorority. And either one is fine. That's the nature of it, right? But, but let me ask you the question, like, did you consider any sorority other than a white sorority? Me? Yeah. Um, not really, because I was DM'd by a girl to join the Asian mm-hmm. sorority, and... I declined her offer to the Rush events just because I don't really have any culture, so I don't think I'd be able to connect with them. Hang on. You do have culture. I just want to be clear. You do have culture. You have white culture, right? Yeah. Which is awesome, right? No, that, that's really important. Look, white people do not... I, I'm, I'm not saying you did this. I think you just said it this way, but I, just, I need to do a PSA for white people. White people, can you, like, make sure you don't... Just because you're white doesn't mean you don't have culture, man. I, I'm, I have so much, I think, call it, like, damn. If you go to, go to Europe, I, if you've spent as much time in, in Europe as I have in so many countries, I've lived in Europe for a couple of years with different countries, it's like, dude, the culture is amazing. It's awesome. It's cool. And American white culture is awesome. It's cool. Dude, white people. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's cool, like it's good. Anyway, so yes, yeah, so you do have culture. You have white 
culture. And you have the best of white culture, right? Because in a way, like, you have certain, certain phenotypes that, that don't match in some ways the expected culture, which is even more awesome, man. Randy, you ready? Um, what do you think it would take for you? Could you have, how many, how many white people did you grow up with? Zero. Seriously? Zero? You grew up in a, bl in a black community? Yeah. So therefore, the chances of you being comfortable in Cali's sorority are between zero I mean, and I, zero? I, like, when I got to Penn State, I mean, there was, like, one white girl in my high school. We were, like, I went to a boarding school, a private boarding school. So, like, we were a very small class of 18, and there was one white girl, and she basically fit in with us. Like, she even went to HBCU as well. So, like, I, that's, like, my closest connection to a white person. But then when I got here, I've, like, I expanded myself beyond the black community here. Like, I took uh -huh. that upon myself. But, like, I still wanted to give back to my black community. Like, I personally, I don't, I didn't research any Penhill um, yeah. sorority simply because, like, I don't really see them doing anything beside outside of Thon. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I got you. Hey. Okay. Cool. Ma ma um, Manav and Chayun, do you have another question? Uh, Robert, you mentioned that you have like. Uh, around 10 people who are mixed or not white in your fraternity. So I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this, but during their recruitment, uh, how did you feel like you had common interests or they fit in into the fraternity? Yeah, yeah, they, exactly. How'd they get in? Um, I guess, I don't know, I can't really speak for them and what made <clears throat> SIGAP attractive for them, but like what I did know is that um, like the people who were in the fraternity that, or that came to the fraternity, they ended up like talking to the kids who were already in the fraternity who were like of like the same background. So I think those specific people, or like they would go and bring their friends. And so that's why like, I don't think maybe it was the fraternity as a whole as more just like the one specific person in the fraternity that they may have known. Okay, so it's, are they like, the black and brown people in your fraternity? Are they like, Black and brown, or are they white, black, and brown? Um, like there, there's a. Um, Wait, dude, are you the you're the rush chair? I am the rush chair. Well, the rush chair yeah. You were the rush chair, dude. To, to what degree do you seek out people at Penn State who are not white, as the rush chair, man? Like actively seek out, as opposed to just sort of wait till they come to you. Well, um, so similarly to what Randy said. Our fraternity operates on the basis of we're not really looking for people. We're looking for people who are looking for us. Got you. And so kind of what Robert alluded to before, when you have your zone days or your recruitment events yeah. and people show up to the house, you're looking at the guys who are going to fit that mold of Got what a fraternity you. is. I mean, if the, the word fraternity itself quite literally means a group of people who share the same occupation yeah. or interests. Same interests. And so, so, so this, so this is the problem. This is the thing that we're in with integrate, like the whole thing, right? We, so we look at those photos. It's like, so then it's like, whose responsibility is it, right? So you, we all, and I don't have an answer to this question, but you, 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 you all are like, all of you are saying, hey, we're just sitting back and waiting for people to come to us, and if you're interested in us, then we'll be interested in you. Like you're clearly not gonna. Um, say no whatever right but but then if you sit and wait like this is this is where we're at all the time right so like but at what point then is it incumbent upon people who are part of organizations like this to say man if we just wait y'all people are just going to come to us who look like us and who are like us so we got to actually go out and dig deeper and get like some omani people or something you know what I mean? So that's the question I have. Have you guys, have you all thought about that? Like now we got to go actively recruit. So like Callie, you would see Randy and be like, nah, man, we need some black women in our sorority here, y'all. Like, or you'd see Cheyun and be like, Cheyun, come on, let's go. Like, come check us out. Like, let's go. Like, so that's the question I have. Like, 
to what degree is, is it your responsibility and to what degree is it, nah, just keep doing what you're doing? Well, I think during any recruitment process, regardless if you're in a fraternity or a sorority, um, there is an extent to which fraternities are actively looking to recruit. You yeah. are working with the members of the fraternity or the sorority in any case, and you are actively looking for people who have connections to, yeah. you know, incoming yeah. freshmen in particular. Yeah. And so what we primarily see, or what I've primarily seen, is there is there is a degree of recruitment that goes on beyond just waiting for kids who either yeah. know your name or who yeah. don't know your name and hear it from a friend. I I came to college, I didn't know what frats or sororities were. I had no concept of what it actually is. But look but look at like Mana, Manav over there, right? It's a cool dude now, right? Cool it's dude. Like, is, he, is he a dude that you... But what are the chances? You look, you look at Manav and you look at Robert. You're the Russ chair, right? Absolutely. Ro Robert's nodding your fraternity. What's the, possib what's the likelihood that you're going to be like, yeah, this Robert dude or this Manav dude from India? Where are you from in India, bro? Gujarat. Ahmedabad, Gujarat. Yeah, Gujarat. So, like, be like, dude, we don't have any MFers from Gujarat. Like, let's check out this dude. Yeah, I mean, so in particular, like, uh, referring back to the, the word fraternity before, we have a set of ideals that the fraternity follows, and, and, and yeah. during recruitment, you look for people that personify what our ideals are. All right. And what's so, your GPA, bro? Uh, Three point eight. You could probably use that. We can. No. Yeah, we certainly can. Because <laughs> if I had to guess, if I were looking it up, I'd guess that your fraternity GPA G. We oh, have, I, I believe, the third, the third highest in oh, all. Oh, third highest? All yeah. right, dude. Then you really could use him. You could be I the know. second he's, highest. He's a, he would be an outstanding right. candidate. But. So, but this is the question. Like, you're not on the hot spot here. Absolutely. The, the issue is that this is where we get stuck, right? This is why we're having this conversation. Like, how is it that at what point is it incumbent upon, even like Randy, what, at, what, at what point is it incumbent upon her sorority to be like, Man, y'all, we need more white people in here. Like, come on. Like, let's go. Like, let's do it. So that's that's just a question. I don't. I don't know. I don't. I hear. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Do you have another question? Uh, no. Does anyone have a question? Anyone? Anyone want to? Who? We have. We have six minutes left. Who's got a question they want to ask? But. Yes. Um, I was just wondering about, like, do you take into consideration of, like, the LGBTQ plus community? Like, because for any fraternity or sorority, because I don't, I can't tell, like, if it's just gender neutral, like, either male or female. Yeah. Good question. Um, my sorority does. We do take that into consideration. Um, like we have you a mean in a good way or a, do you mean to accept people or reject them because no like we we accept we accept them yeah um because like you're not looking at somebody just because they're they're um they identify a certain way but like the only thing i know it was like a a big thing the only thing that we don't take like that we don't accept is trans women and i know that's like been a problem it's because it's like it's supposed to be those that are, um, who was born a female. Yeah. So that's the only thing I would That'll say. That'll change, you know. Right. Probably not. No, I don't. Not change. gonna lie. <laughs> nah, even black people do. Dude, by the way, there's so much homophobia in the black community. Like yeah. I can't even begin to walk down that road. But even with that, that will change in time, man. Maybe, maybe not, not in your, the next 10 years, but yeah. it'll change. Everything's changing. Probably like, down, yeah, like years, uh, yeah. Uh, 100 years maybe. Do you have a question? Um, do, you, uh, do any of you think that it is an issue that uh, all the fraternities and sororities are majority white dominated? Do you think it is an issue? That, are, that most of them are white dominated. Um, I don't personally think it's an issue, but I mean, obviously, I'm sure all frats and sororities would want to have more diversity. I just think that it's since it's mostly common interest and connections with the people 
that we're not really looking for a certain look. We're just going with who we connect with and who we feel the most comfortable talking to. Okay, so listen, let me say this though, right? So now I'm gonna be the, the party pooper here. Y'all know like why, hang on. You know like, you know why so many people are, um, are involved in the, the D, D, E, and I work and like everyone's always recruiting and recruiting and recruiting and like Penn State, we're always hearing about all the diversity initiatives and we're out trying to bring people in. Dude, who are you talking to, by the way? Your sisters? No. <laughs> what are you telling them, man? So you know how we're always like putting so much effort into trying to build a connection with people, right? And, and so you hear it all the time, and all this diversity recruitment and diversity initiative and da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and you're like, holy shit, like there's, it's everywhere, it's so everywhere, like why, it's like you feel sometimes like people are, like these organizations and companies and universities are like ramming it down our throats all the time, do you feel like that as an outsider? Do you feel like that's here in the U.S., you see that all the time? Yeah. So look at the reason is because if we just let people go on the basis of what they're comfortable with, right? Nothing changes. Like your your organization is your your two organizations are white. Your organization is black, right? Your the other organizations are Asian or Hispanic or whatever. It's like nothing changes. It's like what happens is you got to go out and force it. It's not about what you're comfortable with, right? It's about what you're uncomfortable with. So it's like you have the Jewish fraternity, right? So it's like if you're a Gentile, go join one of the Jew, the predominantly Jewish frats. Like, you know what I mean? So this is the problem. So I want to go back. What, so the question for the three of you. So the, the question for the three of you is like, what do you, what do you think would have to happen for 10 years from now? that I'm not having this conversation? Like, what would have to happen? Like, what would you all have to do? I mean, I'm not a pessimist, but I don't think, I think because, like, the history of why our organizations were founded in the first place, yeah. Yep. It's like, it's not going to move away from that, but we are open. Like there's been, I've seen like girls join my sorority just like because they share a common interest or they, they feel like they identify more within, yeah. um, with our goals. So I think it's more so like how you present yourself and like what you do, like the yeah. programs that you put on. Um, I think that's it. And it's just like other people have to be willing to like, go and expand themselves, yeah. but like you also have to be um, accepting of other people. Yo, hang on. So, yo, hang on. We have one minute, and Callie, Robert's going to get the last word. What, what Randy just said, we got one minute. What Randy just said I think is really important. Her, her the, the, the way black and fraternities in particular were founded, they were founded in, in a world of segregation and racism. So like you're, that's the essence of your organizations weren't founded in racism. They weren't founded as a place for white people to come together and combat the discrimination and prejudice that they were feeling from other groups. That's not why they were founded, but yours was. And so yours not going to really go away from that. You all are just being you. So like what w final, you got, dude, you got 30 seconds and then we're going to cut. What would you have to do? I think it sh has to happen slowly. Like the more like representation you see within the fraternities, the more likely someone's going to come to it. So if you like start one by one, more people will start to come. Dude, exactly. All right. Hey, thanks for... Thanks. Yeah, thanks to... Yeah, exactly. It's like the, the guys who like come in...